and soldiers on horses, and soldiers off horses, and soldiers running, and soldiers falling. And the noise, it made the whole house shake. It was horrible. I put my hands over my ears. Ossie put her arms around me. I wanted Molly, but she wasn't there. I started to cry, and then it stopped. The noise, the guns, it stopped. Papa came down, all excited, and told us that General Lee was in our parlor, that General Grant and more soldiers were coming. He said that we should go upstairs until it was all over. As we were walking upstairs, I peeped into the parlor. I saw General Lee sitting behind our big marble table. He looked like he might be asleep. I guess with all this reference going on, he'd be even more tired than the rest of us. As soon as we were at the top of the stairs, a large group of northern soldiers walked through the doors. I saw the soldier that must have been General Grant. All the other soldiers sort of followed him into the parlor. They talked for a long time. Then after they talked, some other soldiers started talking. Even though the generals talked nice enough for each other the whole time, all I could think about was how worried Molly must be in a room full of all those soldiers. It seemed like forever until Mom said I could go downstairs. After General Lee left, General Grant stayed. And even after General Grant left, other soldiers stayed. It seemed like forever until Mom said I could go downstairs to look for Molly. As soon as she could, I rushed down the stairs into the parlor. The parlor looked different. It was almost empty. Almost all the furniture was gone. And I couldn't find Molly. I knew she was there. I remember having her. I looked. Then Lola! Lola, is that you? That's my sister, Ossie. I better be getting back upstairs. If you see Molly, please let me know. Valuable. I see all these youngins here. Are you all friends of Lula's? Did you just go see Lula? She told you about her doll, didn't she? Yeah, she did. Yeah. Well, folks, I, I'm sorry to be, to be kind of gruff with you. That's not my nature, but I am expecting a, uh, a visit from a newspaper reporter of the Richmond Inquirer. He and I have been in telegraphic communication, and truth be told, I'm supposed to sell him uh, the story of this place from back in April for an exclusive. And, well, I was hoping he'd be among the party that just came out. None of you are Mr. Albertson, are you? No? No, no one here works for the papers in Richmond? Well... I expect him by the 7 o'clock hour. Perhaps he's delayed. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, and I can't imagine why you wouldn't, my name is Wilmer McLean. I am the owner of this house. Uh, you've already met my daughter inside. I can uh, safely say that I am the only person that I know of, and probably the only one that you all know of, who can call themselves the Alpha and the Omega of this great conflagration that just rent this continent in half for the last four years. Some of you are looking at me rather cow-eyed and probably thinking to yourself, well, how is it that he makes that claim? And I'll tell you how it is I make that claim. And I know it's a bold statement, but every bit of it is true. And if it's not, well, I hope Zeus strikes me down right here where I stand. For I will tell you this. Every jot and tittle of what I'm about to tell you is the exact truth. Now, I can't give away the whole game because I've promised that to the papers in Richmond, but I will give you a, well, a little taste of the story. In 18 and 61, my wife and family and I lived at a farm up in the northern part of this state, out near a place called Manassas Junction, a place called Yorkshire. And in the summer of that year, we were approached by the Confederate authorities 
who are in need of a place to have headquarters and uh, supplies and a hospital and a signal station. And so, being the stalwart supporters of the Confederacy that we are, and for a nominal fee, we invited the Confederates to use our property there. Well, this did not go unnoticed by the Union artillery. And it was not long before Union artillery shells came crashing over top of our house. And one particular shell <coughs> actually fell through the chimney behind the house up there at Yorkshire and exploded in the kitchen. Well, no one was killed, thank God, behind that. But General Beauregard and his staff were happening to have their afternoon meal in the kitchen at that time. I'm not calling General Beauregard, no, no, nor none of his staff, chickens, but they sure ran out of that place like chickens out of a hen house, I'll tell you that. <laughs> it was not long after that that we removed ourselves from the northern part of the state. It became just too difficult to live up that way. I traveled for a living, taking care of business deeper in the south. I wanted a safe place for my family, especially my girls. Too many soldiers about. Too much drunkenness, too much license. So in 18 and 63, in the fall of that year, we found ourselves here. Now this building here is called by the locals who live here, the Rain Tavern. And it was a guest house of sorts, some sort of hotel back here about 10 years ago. But we moved in there in the fall of 18 and 63 and it has been our home ever since. It was our fondest hope when we came here that we would never see a soldier again in our lives. Well, those hopes were dashed just this past April. On the 8th of April, Robert E. Lee's army arrived here. And they arrived here not to surrender, but to obtain supplies that were up at the rail station three miles from here. And it was General Grant's job to make sure that they were denied those supplies. And having captured the station, General Grant's troops actually blocked this road just up here at the top of the hill, and on the morning of April 9th, General Lee's forces tried to break through it. And a, a savage battle ensued right up there at the top of the hill. And for three hours, my wife, myself, and our children sequestered ourselves in the lower reaches of this house, hearing shot and shell screech over top of our house again. It was just like Yorkshire in 1861, all over again. After three hours, though, there was a lull in the fighting, and I came out here to survey the damage. And as I removed myself to the road here, I was approached by a young Confederate lieutenant colonel named Charles Marshall. And he identified himself as being on Lee's staff and told me that General Lee was desirous of having a place to meet with General Grant. Well, being the stalwart supporters of the Confederacy that we were, and unable to find another place, I of course offered General Mar or Colonel Marshall the use of the of the parlor here. Lee and Grant met there for approximately 90 minutes, and when it was all over, they left. And you know what we got for our trouble? I'll tell you what we got. We got robbed is what we got. Every Union soldier who was left here after Lee and Grant left the premises took every bit of food or every bit of furniture that they could carry out of that room. Said they wanted souvenirs, keepsakes, mementos. Took it all. And I know some of them left money on the windowsill or threw it in the floor and some walked by me and stuffed it in my pocket. But without my consent, that's still thievery. Several days later, on the 12th of April, the rest of Lee's army marched right into this town and right along this road here and down to the Pierce house on the other side of the courthouse. They laid down their weapons. So even the very roadstead we're standing in is steeped in history. And I, I alone, was witness to all of it. Now, today, there's no money here and no prospect for making any money, except for a wise man might make a few dollars. 
And with that in mind, I'll tell you this. I have a bargain for you. I have in my hand parole passes. Now these were printed up over there at Clover Hill Tavern and they were printed for Confederate soldiers. The Union Army printed up 30,000 of them, but they only used 28,000, which left a few thousand for me to sweep up and come take care of. I will sell each and every one of you as many of these as you like for the small sum of two Yankee dollars a piece. If you don't think that's enough of a bargain, on the reverse side, I have inscribed a small keepsake for your visit here and my signature. And I give you that gratis. Now, don't be concerned. You don't have to limit yourself to just one of these. I'll sell you the whole lot of them if you like. And keep in mind, with the holidays coming, they make a nice gift or a keepsake to a friend. If you're not interested in these, I had a printer in Lynchburg make up carte de visite. <laughs> <laughs> and these, I will let go at the rock bottom price of $5 a piece, $10 with my signature. Don't, don't everybody come up at once. <laughs> Please, walk around the village, take care of the things you need to take care of. But by the end of the evening, if you're still interested, I'll still be here. And what could be better than having a memento from the Alpha and the Omega? My family owned this general store right here behind you. Uh, that is the meat store. Uh, now, you gentlemen, y'all need yourself a, a new good hat or a good breast watch, or y'all ladies need some of the finest fashion from Paris, France, or even any of your local gossip. You come here to our store if you need it, all right? Well, <laughs> you know, we had a pretty good business here in town. Folks all through the county would come here to our store, getting all things what they need. And I tell you, we was mighty prosperous. Well. I reckon that is, until this war come about. Well, I'm sure y'all heard tell of all things what's spreading through with this war. <laughs> I know that all through the winter of last, uh, 60, and all through the first months of 61, I mean to tell you, talk of the war was spreading through this county like a July brush fire. In fact, it wasn't too long that we started seeing the effects of it as well on our prices here in the store. Brother, I'm here to tell you. Used to be we could get a barrel of sugar for just twenty dollars, a full hog's head barrel. I'm here to tell you. About March of '61, that same barrel of sugar would run you almost a hundred and fifty dollars. Now it was getting mighty plain that our business won't want to hold up none with prices the way it was. In fact, I heard tell that Mr. Hicks, what ones are tavern over here, heard tell he had to up his prices to almost four dollars a night just to make ends meet. Well. I reckon it was by about April of 61 that uh, they was talking about forming up some companies and then out of our county here in Appomattox. <laughs> we got to talking about it one evening around the fireplace there, uh, me and my mother and father and my old brother Mayor. Now we got to talking about it and they decided that the oldest son of the family, he ought to go off and fight, but you know, he had been courting this girl from down there at Walker's church for about four months. And he had told me some things I reckon he hadn't told uh, Mama and Daddy, if you understand what I mean. <laughs> and I know that that man needed to stay here with his wife to be. I just turned an 18 on the second day of March of this year, know that it was going to be my right to go and protect my family, represent my name in this war. Well, I remember one day I was walking over across the courtyard, seen a sign hanging up there. It said that come May, 28th day of May, all men from here in the county could go up and join Company H of the 2nd Virginia County. Lord, I tell you, I seen that paper, I was grinning like a possum eating saw fries. Here to tell you, <laughs> I know that my time was finally coming where I could go and defend my family, protect my old Virginia. Showing up, 28th day of May, I got myself up, walked over there to that courthouse, great big old long table setting yon. Whole line of men what made it there for me, I got up in that line and got up there to that table. 
That man got to questioning me as to what my name was, where I was from, and how old I was. They let me pass my health examination. Said I was the healthiest they'd seen, mind you. <laughs> Went from there, they sent us on up to the deep of there, where we was to draw our uniforms. They give me this nice jacket here, give me my hat, and even give me my rifle. How proud I was to be a member of our army to defend my country. Now, we was to strike out from here, I reckon, would have been about, oh, I believe the second day of June is when they told us. I slipped back home to see my mama right before we left out. And I never had seen such a troubled face on her before. She couldn't hardly make eye contact with me. She commenced to cry, and I said, Mama, what's wrong? What's wrong? She said, Lafayette, I done had the awfulest dream, so said, now you mind yourself when you go off the wall. You better be home soon. You better come back to us, you hear? I said, oh, Mama, ain't nothing to worry about. Ain't a thing to worry about, Mama. I said, we're going to win this war simple as anything. I told her, why, you heard about the fighting ratio, what the, uh, the government's talking about, ain't you? She said, no, Lafayette, I, I don't know what you're speaking of. I said, well, of course, Mama, the fighting ratio. Well, three of our boys is just as good as one of them Yankees, ain't it? <laughs> She didn't seem to find that too funny, but <laughs> I left my folks behind and struck out. He was told that the first place we was going to was up there around Fairfax Courthouse. Told us them Yankees was trying to inch their way further and further down into our Virginia and our old dominion. Well, I reckon uh, something got funny in the weather with me. I got down with the awfulest feeling I ever had. A sickness what I couldn't describe. I reckon I must have been sick for three weeks and talk started to come and that there was going to be a fight take place, a real fight, a genuine battle coming right upon us over there around Manassas is where they said it was going to be. Sure enough, my boys got out there to that fight, but I was too sick to be a part of it. That doctor would come and see me every day laid up in the bed. He'd look down in my eyes and shake his head. I'd say, what's wrong with me, doctor? What's the matter? Why, why can't you tell me? He said, oh, boy, you just keep praying. You're just going to get better, all right? I said, yes, sir. Well, you know, I reckon I was one of the first boys to go off and fight in this war. One of the first men to come home. But you see, when I come home, they laid me over in that field. Sure, y'all probably got places to go and things to do, but I thank you for your time. Fine evening to y'all now. Take care. Mr. McKinney, we had already made the arrangements 
about that law before this, this set auction would take place. Sir, I know of no such discussion of what you speak. You don't? No, sir. Why, it took place right here in your dining room. Just last there week. was no agreement made, so this you, you know as well as everyone that this was to be an open auction for all to come and make a bid. Well, be that as it may, folks, you understand this was a, a private gentleman's agreement. Once again, sir, Mr. May, no such agreement was made between you and I. And furthermore, by saying it did, you are calling me a liar. Right here on my own porch. Well, sir, may you be reminded that you have given me your word. Sir, my word is not given lightly, and when I give it, everyone knows. And if it comes to my word against yours, then fine citizens of Appomattox, I do not fear the result. Now, you see here, is that this time, after having lately returned from my duties as, as deputy, I saw my brother being accosted on his very own porch in his tavern. Naturally, I took the side of my brother and did my best to separate the two of them. Seeing this altercation get out of hand, I returned to the parlor where I knew a loaded pistol was kept. So there I was, folks, being savagely beaten by a man I'd not seen before. There's, there's only one thing I could do to free myself from this attacker. Grab my small penknife and strike it. Seeing the effect to which my blow had had, I realized this man was none other than Mr. McDermott's own brother. Well, not being a violent man, a, a man of well, but law, I saw fit to, to remove myself from this situation. I returned from the parlor to the hallway to find my dear brother William. Had he been slashed in the throat, the wound was mortal, there was nothing that could be done. His very life's blood ebbing away. He died in a matter of moments. I returned to the porch and seen this cowardly, cold-blooded murderer trying to make his escape. I called for Mr. May to halt. He did no such thing, and I was forced to open fire. The bullet struck him in the side, but sadly due to an insufficient powder charge, the wound did not prove fatal. He staggered off, and the search party was mounted, a posse, if you will, a $100 reward posted in the Lynchburg newspaper. And nothing was found for days until finally, near a week later, Mr. May was found not five miles from this town. His wounds required attention and received several weeks of care under Dr. William Christian, who lived just a few miles away, before being deposited in our brand new county jail. Now, all this time, folks, my brother, he was buried in county justices. They, they met in my carriage house just a few days after to vote a resolution of thanks to my brother for his short but gallant service to this county as an officer of the law. And you see, dear friends, I was lying in the jail just behind you, recovering from my terrible wounds. The whole time, preparing for my own life should a group of a vigilant band from this county descend upon me and murder me myself. You mean simple citizen seeking justice, sir? A vigilante justice? Well, after what you have done by murdering your own deputy sheriff and officer of the law of this brand new county? I would, I would expect more from citizens such as you to allow such a thing to happen. Well, as you all can see, it was rather difficult to find an unbiased jury here in Appomattox County to hear this case. It's a small community, you understand. Well, Judge Wilson, that spring, he decided as much and removed the venue of the trial to Amherst County, not 30 miles distant. And there I was given a proper trial by a group of unbiased peers such as you, and I was, of course, found not guilty by reason of self-defense. I can't believe it, but folks, do you know what happened before he was released on this so-called self-defense? Apparently that temper of his, which you saw displayed here, reared its head once again in court. For the judge in the case, before Mr. May was released, he was forced to post a $4,000 bond of his own money for his own good behavior. Now, that does not sound like a completely innocent man to me, but I'll leave it up to y'all. Needless to say, and luckily for those of us here, Mr. Coleman May was never seen or heard from here in Appomattox County again.
this looks a little strange. I think that I can explain it all to you if you just give me the opportunity. Uh, you might have find me allowing my skivvies, but I don't suppose we should dispense with propriety altogether. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Colonel Augustus Root. I'm the commanding officer of the 15th New York Cavalry Regiment, and I'll explain it to you best I might. The last thing I remember is Lee was coming east, and of course, was heading to supplies or up at Appomattox Station, about three miles down the road. And General Custer isn't the type of man just to let Bob Lee get his hands on some supplies, so we went after the trains. Went after the trains, happy to say that we captured them. Some rebel artillery was there in force, and made quick work of those boys. Sent them on their way, scurrying along. And as we were chasing the rebels back from the station, they are coming back in the direction of the main body of Lee's army. So as we were chasing them back here, through the streets of town, I remember the boys were near coming through at a gallop, and about a dozen of us. And with me in the lead, cheering and hurrahing to the top of my voice, got right here to about this spot, and happened to look off in this direction. And right over there, by this blacksmith's shop, in front of a white oak tree, I saw a rebel peeping his head out, just long enough to get a good sight on me before I had a chance to do anything about it. He leveled his musket, fired, and he found his mark. Can't tell you exactly where he hid. I can tell you it doesn't hurt so much here, or here, but right here is where it's given me trouble. And I was unhorsed, fell to the ground, and as the lifeblood was coming out of this area right about here, I happened to look up. I saw that there was a sergeant I believe it was a man from Company I, and he was just begging to be put out of his misery. I don't know if anyone obliged him. And another rider was over here, and he was dead in the saddle. Strangely enough, everything else was peaceful. Dark curtain closed in, and I met my demise right here as you see it. Oh, uh, wasn't long after I spent my last mortal moments here on this earth that some rebels came up from the hollow and they at least waited until I was dead before they started to remove my boots and then they took my sword for a nice souvenir. But that wasn't quite enough so they took my coat and they took my trousers as well and so I guess that explains why you found me laying here in my skivvies. It's a hard thing be one of General Grant's final casualties. But I'll tell you this, my sacrifice is what it took to preserve our union. Well, I guess it's something of an honor to be one of the last sacrifices laid on that altar. So, here I am, hurrah for the union. Can't help thinking about my poor wife, Nancy, my little Cora. George, but if there's any consolation, I guess it's that their daddy died with his face to the end.